Hi everybody, welcome back to another video in our video exhibit series. Today we're looking at an item that was a recent donation. Uh, we do have, I believe, another one of these at the warehouse, but we figure since this one's uh, fresh in our collection, we would take a look at it. So Sam, what, what is this? This is the TI-99 4A. So the TI-99 4A was a home microcomputer that was released in 1981. And this was a follow-up to Texas Instruments TI-99 4, which wasn't as successful. It was only out for a little bit. It had a chiclet-style keyboard and didn't have, have as good of a graphics chip as this one does. Um, so they released the 4A uh, with a better graphics chip. Actually, uh, could support sprites, two-channel sound, and it had a real keyboard. And those are kind of big things in 1981. The only other computer really at the time that we had sprite support and multi-channel sound would be like the Atari uh, line of computers. Uh, the VIC-20 um, did have some decent sound but did not support sprites. So uh, for the time, the TI-994A a was a, a big player in the home computer market. Texas Instruments um, supplied a lot of chips to other home computers and larger computers and mainframes and things like that. So they knew they knew the market. They knew what they were doing, or at least they should have known what they were doing when they released this computer. Yeah, I feel like I've heard of TI more in parts than actual <laughs> products, except for like calculators and stuff right. like that. Right. They did dominate the calculator market and actually developed a rivalry with Commodore because of that. They famously um, outpriced Commodore on the chips because they supplied the chips for Commodore's calculators for years. They made the price on the chips almost overnight too expensive for Commodore to be able to make their computer, make their calculators and make a profit. So Commodore bought Moss Technologies. They were able to make their own chips. And so they stayed competitive and eventually made their own computers and things like that. I'm looking at this. So is this the computer and the keyboard or what's the situation? You, you would think uh, traditional design, this would be the computer and this would be the keyboard. But in reality, this is the uh, computer itself. Um, it has in, in, vein, in the same uh, vein as like the Commodore 64, VIC-20, and Atari home computers. It's an all-in-one design. Um, it has a cartridge port right in the front, right here. In the back, it has a power supply jack. It has a, uh, a video jack and one joystick port on the side. Now, the joysticks that came with the TI-99 were two controllers wired together. So, although it looks like an Atari-style port, an Atari joystick will not work in the air. You have to get a special adapter to make them work. So, that is a... So you can plug other controllers in, but you have to have an adapter for them. Correct, because this computer is expecting it to be two controllers wired together, so the pinout is different. So they're not compatible, um, just as they are. I was going to ask, what's this, this piece here? So this is a speech th synthesizer module. Uh, the ti 994 a had an expansion port right here on the side with a little trap door to open up. And initially, all expansions would come right in the side here. You'd have all these different sidecars. And the problem is that those sidecars would get so long... Uh, you would re need a really big desk. It wasn't really practical for people to use. Um, so what happened is uh, this box would basically be a way to expand the capabilities hefty wire back of here. the TI-99 4A. So this would plug into the side of the, uh, the little port over there. You don't have oh. to do it, but that would plug in there. Okay. And then built into the PEB uh, when it was released, you'd have a 5 and a quarter inch disk drive, a 32K memory expansion, and an RS-232 uh, expansion card in here. Uh, now there are eight expansion slots in here but don't forget one already has to be taken up by the cord to hook it's up to the computer right and you're gonna want a memory expansion so you've already got like three or four slots already taken up but for a home computer although this is big bulky and it was very expensive it's almost fifteen hundred dollars when it came out compared to the home computer which was five hundred twenty five dollars when it came out um this is probably the only one of the only home computers microcomputers of this price range that could have this kind of expandability but originally this computer only had about 16k so now you're going to get 32K on top of it with this. You could add more uh, cartridges to it. So if you take the top off, there's two little latches here in the back. This whole thing is made of heavy sheet metal. The power supply is about the third of the size gonna, of this I'm box. Gonna, we can lean this so you guys can see the inside. So you can see some of the open expansion ports right there. This is the RS-232 uh, cartridge. Uh, this is the interface cartridge. And this is the disk drive controller cartridge. And it comes in a cartridge like this. It's just a board inside. It comes in these nice little cartridges. And you can just slide them in and click it in and that's it. In addition to having this expansion box, probably the most common peripheral sold for the TI-99 was this, and this is the uh, speech synthesizer. See, Texas Instruments had the speak and spell. They are big into speech and voice synthesis. Um, and this would allow the computer to use certain programs and games to have uh, a speech synthesis. Speech synthesis. Um, some of the games used it, like Alpine or I know would speak to you and things like that. Um, but also there was a terminal a terminal cartridge which allowed you to actually do uh, text-to-speech, 
which is a big thing for a home computer of this price range to be able to do. And this is processing text, not just reading a file in the computer. Is actually correct. There was a cartridge where I believe they w there was some pre-programmed words, which sounded a lot better. But the terminal emulation cartridge, literally, you could type in any word, even words it doesn't know, and it would um, attempt to pronounce them as best it could, which was big technology for again a home computer of this price range in 1981. And this is something that would plug into a TV. This would plug into a TV. They did sell external monitors, but it could plug into a TV. It came with an RF modulator, but you could get um, composite cables, like most home computers at the time, mm -hmm. and plug in with a composite signal. Seems like it's a lot more than I thought it was. I assume, assumed it was just this, or this is a keyboard, but it seems like it was a lot more than even the other it was, the it Apple was, and stuff at the time. At its peak, I believe it controlled about 35% of the home computer market. It sold, I believe this sold about 2.8 million units, if I remember correctly. So it did sell rather well. I believe like... This actually sold about 250,000 units, so these were expensive, but they did sell reasonably well. What ended up happening with this is that the computer had a, uh, this computer actually had a 16-bit microprocessor, which sounds great. Super Nintendo has a 16-bit microprocessor. The problem is it was designed around an 8-bit microprocessor, the whole system. And towards the end of development, they realized there was a, a bug in the chip. They couldn't use it, so they just threw in a 16-bit microprocessor. So everything in here has to be filtered from an 16-bit to an 8-bit multiplexer to allow this to work on a 16-bit chip. So it's not really 16-bit graphics by any means, but it, technically it's a 16-bit computer. Sounds a little better than it, than it is. <clears throat> That's true. So what ended up happening with this, long story short, uh, Commodore and Texas Instruments continued their rivalry, but since Commodore owned their own chip manufacturing with MOS technology, Commodore was able to undercut the price of the TI-99. It eventually got to a price war where Commodore eventually realized that Texas Instruments was producing their, their uh, were producing these at a loss. And because they didn't, Texas Instruments didn't really license out their, uh, their, their product to other people, they didn't want third-party manufacturers really making software for this, really that much. I think towards the end they did change their minds. Originally they tried making all the software themselves. Well eventually they, <laughs> that became a problem because they were losing money in every console sold. And once it got to that point, Commodore just undercut their price again and Texas Instruments pulled out I think in about 1984. They pulled out the home consumer, the home com, uh, computer market altogether. And went back to calculators. Yeah, and so com and Commodore got the last laugh. They went, they were able to undercut the price. Uh, so that's, when, that's around when you had Commodore 64 is being sold for like $100 with a mail-in rebate. So. Well, that is a very interesting history for such a simple looking machine. It it's, really is. It's often forgotten about the TI 994A, but it had certainly had its place in home computer history. Well, as always, we do thank Sam for bringing yet another item either from the warehouse or as this was a recent donation, so we appreciate that donation. As always, guys, if you like, comment, subscribe, we do appreciate that as well, and we'll see you guys next time.